All right, everyone, so for our second day of class, we're going to continue to talk about storing data and such. We're going to get more complex now. So let's uh, go, uh, go ahead and open up our web browsers for the moment to look at one of the possible solutions to the issue of having a database in our app. Let's go over to the website pouchdb.com. P-O-C-H-P-O-P-O-U-C-H-D-B.com, pouchdb.com. PouchDB, the database that syncs. PouchDB is an open source JavaScript database inspired by Apache CouchDB that is designed to run well within the browser. PouchDB was created to help web developers build apps that work as well offline as they do online. So the big idea with the database is, okay, we've got JSON and it'll store data on, into it and such, and we played with it last time. But then what about when you uh, go from one app, I mean one device to another, or from the website version of the project to the mobile app version of the project? That data then would fall out of sync. It wouldn't be synchronized anymore from going to device to device because it will have a different JSON file. So there's many solutions to that problem, and here's one of them, PouchDB. And so this is the website where we're going to keep up to date with the blog. The latest version is 5.1.0. It just came out like two or three days ago. And uh, I've been following the project since probably 2 point something, and I've seen it evolving and getting better. It's cross-platform. It works on all the web browsers. More importantly, it works in a mobile project. It works on Android, iPhone, Windows Phone, etc. It's based on JavaScript uh, syntax, so that'll be familiar. We have then guides, getting started and such, the API, which is the more detailed manual, how does it all work, and then learn some tutorials. So the way it'll work is we've got some simple JavaScript commands. It's all JavaScript. Var db equals new pouch db db name. So the syntax of that, we've seen this. This is create a variable. We're going to call the variable db, database. And in it, we're going to put the object pouch db. That is not a standard JavaScript command. That's a command that makes sense once we've loaded the pouch library. Download pouch, right? So we're going to say, let's put a new pouch object into this variable. And the object is going to have a name, db name. So db is basically shorthand for a fully functional database. Then what we can do is, once we've got this database created, the first line, we can do db put, db changes, db replicate. db put, let's put something into the database. Because this team made up this database, you can make it up however you want, invent your own commands and such. They created these commands that should make sense when you read them. Uh, when you when you read them, you know, when you look at them at a glance. Put, db.put, kind of makes sense. Put something into the database. db.changes, if there's changes on the database. db.replicate, replicate the database, copy it. db.put, we're going to put something into the database. What you should see that we're putting into the database should be familiar from Tuesday. JSON. Key value, comma, key value, comma, key value, end. Curly braces. So we're putting JSON, a JSON object, into this database. We don't have to rely on a something.json file. That would be limiting. We're going to be putting our database objects into the PouchDB database which on a technical level is saved in the web browser, uh, but the way we're going to use it, it gets saved into the app, the mobile device. We need a field called ID. This one is required, underscore ID. It has to be like that, because we have to be able to reference a unique object in the database. Just like when you sign up for a social network, and it asks you for an email or a username, let's say a username, I want to be you know, Victor on Facebook. Oops, that was taken 10 years ago. I want to be Victor on Twitter. Oops, that was taken 7 years ago. Okay, I want to be Victor on Instagram. Oops, that was taken 4 years ago. 
I want to be Victor on uh, what's the hot new social network? Snapchat. That was taken a year ago. So we need an, a unique identifier for one record in our database, one document in our database. Our terminology is going to be a document. A document can have as many of these fields as we want. This JSON object is one document that we're putting into the database. Every document needs a unique ID. It has to be like this underscore ID colon, whatever. That can be anything. An email, a username, a number, a date, comma, any number of fields I want. Dave at gmail.com is the unique ID. No one else can use that email address in this database of a social network, let's say. Name David. These can be, these don't have to be unique. These, there can be a million Davids. That's the unique one always. String, string, what's that one? Number. Number. The, the type is a number, the type is a string. We can put any kinds of types, basically, like we saw with JSON. db.changes on change. That's reminiscent of jQuery when we have a button that we want to click on. We reference the, the, the unique ID, and then we've got dot on click. So when we click the button, it does something. This is similar in that sort of vein. We're referencing a database on change when the database changes. Simply just display in the console, there's been changes. There's been t -t 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 changes. That could be anything else, like uh, update on screen, make a pop-up happen, uh, make a copy of the database, etc. But whenever the database changes, do something. This is built in. And then db.replicate to copy this whole database of one document to the server. Then we have db replicate from. So we can pull the data from the database. And internally it'll keep track of revisions and all that other cool stuff so that your data doesn't go out of sync. But this is what we're going to use to create a database in our project. It works on a plain old web project and it'll work on an Android project slash iPhone slash Windows Phone etc cross-platform. Any questions so far? So it'll just go on to say it's cross-platform, lightweight, easy to learn. Here's the latest info. Follow them on Twitter. Check the code on GitHub. Go look at Couch. And all of that. Let's look at... Uh, let's take a quick look at guides at the top. This is more of the quick conceptual introduction to Pouch. It's not super detailed. What is it? What's so great about it, which is sync. You want to synchronize your data. You've got a bunch of chapters on the left like setting it up. Um, it gets... Um, okay, that's setting up couch. Setting up pouch. Basically to set it up all you need is a reference to it in in the head or the body of your HTML file. We need a script declaration to say use the pouch JavaScript library just like we've been doing with jQuery or jQuery Mobile. Other ways to do it as well, add it to your index using Node, etc, uh, etc. Et Working with databases. Again, the main idea is create a variable, a plain old JavaScript variable, and the secret is new, PouchDB, and whatever database name you want. In this case, it's kittens. So we can create as many patch databases as we want, store as much data as we want, basically, and each one will have its own unique internal name. How do you do this from a server? Gives you the example right there. It's the same sort of syntax, but then you're referencing a server. The server has to be running... Um, 
has to be running uh, couch, and that's why uh, back here it pops up setup couch DB. So to really have it synchronized from a local device to a remote device, you need a server. You need a server where you can install the couch database protocol. And as an example, get info about the database. Um, so this is a this is a, a JSON JSON uh, string of data. DB name colon kittens comma dot count zero dot deletion count zero update sequence zero etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So the database itself then tells you about itself in a JSON string. It tells you what version of it it is and what's its name. It's just in JSON format. Curly braces, obviously not that easy to read because it's all one long string, but this, if this were divided line to line, it would be a little easier to read. But it's the same. Key, value, pair, comma, 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 all the way until the end. So what we're going to do together then is I've got a project where we're going to focus on creating pouch databases and adding to the database and retrieving from the database, deleting files and then updating them, documents from the database. That's what we're going to do. It's going to be standalone for the moment so we can just focus on how does pouch work. When we get that working, then most likely next time, we'll integrate that into our app from last month and see what we need to do in order for it to be most effective as a as an Android app, as a mobile app. So that's our goal. Questions? So does this maintain the current level on people's telephones of applications? Does it maintain the current what? The, the current level of it. Let's say I've got no, uh, they wouldn't use Pouch because it's relatively new. Um, they've probably Google, for example, has their own proprietary database system. But I'm sure somewhere, um, somewhere in the website, there's a part that says who's using Pouch. Usually, with these open source projects, there's a list of what of what companies, apps, and developers are using a project. So um, we could use it for that. You know, we can use it to keep track of who's using our app. Are they have they updated or not, and that sort of thing. Um, but there's so many kinds of databases out there. Remember, if we go back to the Wikipedia article and look up NoSQL, we'll see a huge article, and one of the items in there is Couch slash pouch. That is one way to solve the problem about databases on mobile. So what's the difference between couch and pouch? Couch came out first and it and it's really uh, requires a data uh, a server. You need a server to install the software, run the software, create your databases, retrieve your data. This one doesn't. It just works in the browser. The browser itself is sort of a virtual server and then so pouch just uses what resources the web browser has and it does everything we need. Is there a size limit difference? I, I think there is uh, for the uh, for the server version couch DB there's the limit of the server. Yeah. So if you've got 100 megabytes on the server that's your that's the extent of your database. There are different limits on pouch which is dependent on the the device. And somewhere here, it explains, it gives you a list of what the sizes are somewhere. Yeah, it's going to be in here somewhere. Frequently asked questions, maybe. What can it sync with? How much, oh, here we go. How much data can Pouch store? Uh, in Firefox, 50 megabytes. In Chrome, it's... Uh, it's based on the user's hard drive. In Opera, it's like Chrome. In Internet Explorer, it's 250 megabytes. Safari, 50 megabytes. Android, 200 megabytes. So, what is 
it is especially database data is often you know raw text mm -hmm. so yeah it's a lot if it, of video, if it was video yes yes usually however you'd just be storing a reference to the video you'd store the video on the memory card and then in pouch have a reference to the file location so you wouldn't really put the video data in the database you'd put a, a location to the video in the database and then uh, in, in, in Cordova, you can have unlimited data on iOS and Android by using the SQLite plugin. <clears throat> so since we'll be running Android, we have 200 megs. But if we, if we want to have unlimited, we have to do something slightly different, which is not the default to use SQLite. But uh, there you go. So check out the documentation. This is what we're going to use. Any other questions? Okay, I'm going to close this. You can uh, refer to it as needed. But I'm going to close it because I have a few items for you in the network folder. Let's go ahead and open the computer, computer window and go to the network. Go to our class, Campus Android 3. What you want to do is drag at least a copy of PouchDB Example 5 1 start. Drag a copy of that to your desktop. If you'd like end, you can do that one too. That's the end result that we're going toward. Just like last time, I gave you this, the JSON practice start file, which was minimal, and then the end result, and then what I ended up with at the end of the day. For today, just copy start at least, and I'm going to show you what's in end, but you don't need end. You, you definitely want start. PouchDB start. All right, let me show you the end file. In there, we've got two JavaScript libraries jQuery 214 and Pouch 5.0. I haven't downloaded 5.1 yet. And then a, a text file of tutorials and links that you can check out for more information and then an HTML file. I'm just going to double click the HTML file to load it in the browser. Mine looks like it's going to open in Opera, so whatever, just let it open if you'd like. We've got a very simple interface. Um, three fields where it's asking for CRN, class title, and instructor. So again, this is going to go back to we're going to make an app about uh, students being able to save a class list and a class plan and so forth. So the three pieces of information we want to save are the CRN, which is the that unique number of the class, the title of the class, and the instructor. So let's say this is class 1, 2, 2, and it's English 1, and instructor Jones. I have buttons clear the fields. I have button to add a class and show classes. So if I add a class, this gives me some basic feedback. Class added. Okay, show the classes. I already did it before the start of the class, so I've got two items in the database. But there's CRN 122, class English 1, Instructor Jones, CRN 123. Class I, Android One and Campus. So I've added with add class, I added data to the database. With show classes, I retrieve data from the database. And in the beginning, it's going to be very basic just to understand the concept, and then we'll make it more interesting looking and user friendly. Adding database, retrieving database, delete from a database. So if I click the delete button, little pop-up that says, well, you didn't select the CRN. Let's say I want to delete class English 1. It has a CRN, 122. Delete. Got deleted. Obviously, we would want maybe other abilities like a pop-up screen to confirm, and instead of me manually putting the class, I wanted to do it for me, all of that advanced stuff. But we have to start somewhere before we get that advanced. 
And I don't have it on this example, but we'll get to it. I want to update the classes. Maybe I misspelled something. I want to I want to update and change that. We'll be able to do that well, but I don't have it in this example yet. So very basic. Um, you know. This right here would be the front end. This would be uh, asking for the input, and it's being saved into the database, and that's the back end. The database itself is the back end. Not that pretty looking, but we can make it prettier later with jQuery Mobile. So Android 2, and it's Campos add class, show classes. There we go. So that's our concept. That's what we're going to go toward today. We should be able to get it done today. We'll introduce several concepts, pouch of course, and other JavaScript concepts. <clears throat> and then eventually we'll integrate this with our app and give it other functionality like deleting, uh, like uh, updating records, updating documents, making it look nice. Any questions? So that was the end file. We're going to start with the start file. Make sure you've got PouchDB example start. What I've got in there, I already downloaded the, the libraries, jQuery 214 and Pouch 5. And you can look at tutorials on your own. But what I want to do is create a basic HTML file and start, start learning these concepts and creating databases in pouch. So let's open uh, notepad plus plus open notepad plus plus go to file new and then let's save as make sure you save into that start folder because we're going to need that jQuery file and more importantly the pouch file. Make sure you're saving index.html in the pouch start index.html just index html the, the the usual then we'll take a moment to create a very basic html5 file again it's about 10 lines so doc type HTML, HTML opening and closing tags, head tag, right? Same thing we did last time, Tuesday. Oops, thank you. So 10 lines, just go ahead and create that basic HTML file. And we'll proceed. Does anyone need to sign in sheet?
So that's our standard index file template. And what we want to do further is, okay, we want the ability to use jQuery so we can take advantage of its uh, shortcuts and such. In the folder, we've got a jQuery library, so we need to access it, we need to reference it. We're going to add it to the head, so I'm going to go back to line 6. I'm going to add the script tag pairs. I'm going to connect to two JavaScript libraries. So we've got script source equals jQuery dash two dot one dot four dot min dot js. So last time if your jQuery didn't work, that was the culprit. You didn't type that correctly. jQuery dash two dot one dot four dot min dot js. I'm going to copy that line to maybe save myself a little bit of typing. Copy line 6 and paste it after itself, line 7. But then we're going to change the source. In the second script tag, we're going to reference the pouch db uh, JavaScript library. So that one is pouch db 5.0.0. I don't uh, dot min dot js. I don't have the latest one from the website. I forgot to get it. That was five point one point zero. We'll just use five zero zero. So I'm going to load these two libraries up in the head because remember it goes when this loads in the browser it goes from line 1 to line 12 and it looks at every line and it executes it puts it into memory and so forth so right here we've got jQuery and pouch ready to go and I put jQuery first uh, just so that we make sure that we have the jQuery commands ready to use before pouch then what I'm going to do is add some inline well, not inline, some embedded uh, JavaScript like we did last time. We can put this in a separate JavaScript file, but I just want to keep it all in one file so that I can quickly get back to it in our testing phase here. So what I mean is, let's go to line 11 and let's create a script pair. This time we'll spread it on two lines because we're going to type a bunch of JavaScript in between those lines there. But we'll get back to that in a moment. I'm going to go back to right after the heading 1, line 11. So we're going to type a lot of JavaScript here, but before that, let's set up an interface. Back on line 11 is where we're going to have these input boxes. An input box is, uh, is usually part of a, a form, F-O-R-M, not forum, but a form. And a form uh, can have a variety of inputs. It can have a box where you type in a name. It can have a box that has multiple lines. It can be another kind of input where it's a drop-down menu to select items. So you've seen these before. Let's say you're filling out an application online. It's probably got a bunch of input boxes and some drop-down menus and some radio buttons and such. Those are all basically input forms, input elements of a form. So what we need to do first is write the form tag. And that has a pair. This is an old standard HTML, probably HTML 2.0 tag. It's been around a long time, but it's been given new life recently. And this, anything inside of these, this pair of form tags is a form um, that we've been used to looking at before. 
but to upgrade it to be able to do more interesting things via JavaScript, let's add an ID to the form. With this ID, we will be able to um, we will be able to do various operations to the form. This is unique ID, anything we want, but this is going to be a form about the classes that we're going to save um, and retrieve and such. So now that form has a unique identifier, and via JavaScript we can reference it easier. We are going to, uh, inside the form then, have three input fields. Class CRN number, class title, and class instructor. So in order for us to have that name uh, basically attached to the input box, we use a tag called label. That has a pair. In the pair, we'll type CRN colon space. This is going to display on screen. It'll say CRN, and it's a label. What's the difference between label and, and just the input? The in, the, uh, in a moment, we're going to connect this text with the input. Okay. So if we only put the input, it might not know that this text is related to that input. Okay, this is just the name of the, of the input box, basically, yes. No, it doesn't need quotes because it's sort of like this, H1 tags, it appears on screen. Oh, yeah. So this is simply like that. This, is, this has a meaning, it's semantic, HTML label has a meaning, it's going to display on screen and then we can control it via CSS and so forth. Um, continuing that same line, then we will add the input tag, but input is one of these that does not have a pair. It has, however, several attributes, because this input could be a box, it could be a drop-down menu, it could be radio buttons. Therefore, inside the input tag, we will say type equals quotes text, the kind of, the, the, the kind of uh, data that we can type into this input field is text. And we can look it up, but we've also got number, so we can have an input box that only accept numbers. Um, what others? Uh, I think we've got one for a modern HTML one. I believe we've got one that's like, a, oh, date. Input type date. That's a pretty modern one, where what's really cool about that is we'll automatically pop up a little calendar, so you can choose a date. That doesn't work on older devices, but we're going to be doing a modern device, so input type date would be useful. Here it's in, uh, we want text. Um, <clears throat> and then we want also an ID so that we can reference it via JavaScript. So we should be seeing, whenever we're using ID, it's either going to be for CSS, but oftentimes for JavaScript, so that the JavaScript can reference it, change it, um, update it, etc. We'll call this title, no, we'll call it CRN field. Yes, that's what I meant, CRN field. This is a field which stores the CRN data. Well, we're going to do one more thing here. Let's back up before the ID and type name equals, and we'll type the same thing, CRN field. I'll explain why in a moment. So it's got type, name, and ID. ID and name are the same. And now what we'll do is we'll back up to label, and we'll say this label is for that input box. That way the, the code and the app will know that that text that is visual relates to that input box. So let's back up to label, and we'll add for the same thing again. This text label is for this input text box. Okay. 
let's run it in uh, we're gonna run this in Chrome I found that for testing purposes with pouch it seems to the when we get to the to the development tools uh, I see that uh, Chrome is actually a little bit better for debugging in this case so let's get used to running this this stuff in Chrome let's take a quick look at it in Chrome we haven't seen what we've done so far it should look something like that you can click in there and type Victor or you can type one two three you can type bad words um, you can type just about anything in there so let's make sure it looks like this so far very basic but here's our code so far anyone need any help So we've got some text and an input box. Did that work for everyone? All right, let's add two more input boxes, almost the same way, so we can kind of copy and paste. But before that, at the end of that line, I'm going to add a break. BR. I want that input box, and then on the next line, another one, and then on the next one, another one. So to save a little bit of effort, I'm going to copy all of line... 12 and paste it two more times. If you typed it right, of course, because the downside of copying and pasting is that if you type something wrong, you've just copied and pasted it wrong a couple times. So label CRN. Okay, CRN is one thing we're asking for. Class name is another thing, and class instructor. Uh, so we'll say that the second input field 13, line 13, is the title. is the title of the class so to be consistent label for title field name title field ID title field I'm going to use that word for the name ID and for so I mean we're going to call this label for title field name is title field and ID is title field. Did you see my shortcuts? If you double click on a property it will select it, I copied it, and then I double clicked on that one, paste, double click on that one, paste. Time savers. And then the third input field we'll call instructor. And uh, notice this is lowercase instructor, lowercase title, lowercase CRM. The uppercase is on the second word field. You might also see that I'm doing some other magical shortcuts to select the whole word like that. That's something uh, on Windows where if you do Control Shift Right, it selects a whole word at a time. If you're holding Shift and you press to the right, it selects one letter at a time. Or Shift Left, it selects one letter at a time to the left. So that's one way. But if you hold Shift and then Control and then Right, it grabs a whole word also to the left. Shift, control, left, it grab four. So that's one way that I quickly select words. Then control C, double click, paste, double click, paste. Um, no, but um, we'll leave it because that'll give us a little bit of extra space below it. We should probably remove it and then we'll control it via CSS, but we might come back to it. <clears throat> so there we go. Three input buttons. Check your uh, check check Chrome. Run it in Chrome and make sure. 
it looks something like that. Of course, later we can align these nicely. You know, I would love for these boxes to be, you know, aligned to the D, for example. That'll be CSS, that'll be later. But here's what we've got so far, input boxes. Here's the code so far. Okay, so um, on the next line, fifteen. Here we'll just start off with an input by itself. We're not going to add a label to it because what we're going to have then are buttons and forms have a method of their own to um, to create buttons. Uh, they're going to be inputs also, but let's add the attribute input type equals reset and then value quotes clear. I won't explain what that is yet. Save it and run it and try it for yourself. Input type reset, value clear. Save it and run it and see if you get what it does. What it should do is you add some data to these fields, you click clear, it clears the fields, resets, resets the fields. Notice instead of it saying clear, if we wanted it to say reset, we would change the value to anything we want. Now the button says something else. So here we made a button. We didn't say anything about the button tag, for example, or data role equals button. Data role equals button would only make sense if we had jQuery mobile library. We don't. This is a jQuery. And we didn't write the button tag because this is an input of type reset in the form field, and therefore it assumes it's a button, and that's what we get. Obviously not styled that interestingly. I would like my own uh, icons and all of that, but we'll get to that later. That's when we get jQuery mobile. On the next line, we'll have another. We're going to copy the same thing two more times. We'll have two more buttons, so three buttons in total. They're going to be of different types and have different values. The second button will have a type simply of button. It's going to be a generic button. And it will have a value of add class. This is our button that when we click it, it will add a class to the database. And the third button will have a type also of button. The third input will have a type of button, generic button, with a value of show classes. I'm going to do this very, very manual. Add a class, show a class. Later we could make it more complex that we have automatic, automatically show the new classes after adding a class, but we'll do it manually first. And because we want these buttons to be clickable and we want them to be um, we want them to be accessible via, uh, to do something via JavaScript. They need IDs, actually. So we'll back up to line 16, the add class button. Uh, we'll add an ID of add class.
and line 17, an ID of show class. Well, classes. This always this always is a problem when we're creating our IDs and such because we're inventing them. What should we call it? Add class and add classes, or add classes and show classes, or add class show class. It's you know up to you. That's your phase of information architecture, IA. What is what are what's all your information? How are you going to architect your your information? That's something that you would design maybe in a style guide. Write it down in some documentation that says we're always going to use plurals, or we're never going to use pronouns, or whatever. So it's not going to be very complex, or it might not matter, but it might matter for you when you get more complex. Add class, show classes, add class, show classes, keeping it consistent. If we save it and run it, I just want to confirm that this looks okay. It's not going to do anything yet. Notice even though I put the three buttons on their own line, because HTML by standard does not make me break, it kept it on one line, which I kind of like. There's the never mind, add class, show class, or clear if you kept it as clear. I'm going to put it back on clear. Only the clear button works because it's built-in functionality, but add class and show class does not work yet. Um, I'm going to do two more things then we'll take a break. Uh, we're going to be inputting stuff to the database and then eventually I want to show that stuff on screen. So we need a placeholder. After the form, line 19, we're going to add a placeholder div. Just like we were working with last time, this placeholder will show anything we want. Error messages, positive feedback messages, or the actual table of data of classes. And therefore it needs an ID. We'll call it the result. So to see if we're on the right track, we will make a simple um, jQuery command, which is that I want to be able to click on the Add Class button, and something will happen just to make sure that jQuery is working. As we saw last time, if we didn't type things correctly, jQuery would not work. So this will be JavaScript. So we'll go into the script block, line 21 or so. And we will start to use the same sort of syntax as we've seen before. Dollar symbol, open close parentheses, that means jQuery. Let's create a jQuery object. Let's reference something on screen in quotes. Pound sign, add class. We're going to be targeting the... Uh, we're going to be targeting that that button on screen. That's what we're saying there. Specifically, at the end, dot on, semicolon. When something happens with that button, do something. That something will be a click. So inside the on, click. Right? We've seen this a few times. It should become second nature. You're going to do this all the time when you've got jQuery. This button, on click, comma, We'll just do a very simple alert, comma. The syntax, however, is function, open close parentheses, open close curly brace. Again, we've seen this before. It's usually just different ID and different function callback, function result. Inside of the curly braces of function, the curly braces, not the parentheses, We'll just do a very simple alert. This will be very obvious that it works. Save it and run it. And what should happen is when you click the Add Class button, you get a pop-up that says it works. That's all we needed to do so far. 
to make sure that we've got that we're on the right track. Let's see. We'll do one more, then we'll take a break. Copy the same line, paste it, and on your own, make the second button work to do something else. A different text. Then take a break. Then we'll take a break at 7:10 to 7:20, and we'll go on.